This is Harvest Field. Happy Sabbath to you all. I would like to welcome all of you here this uh, afternoon. Um, but before I go any further, I'll say I've got a short testimony about last week. Uh, we were about an hour late, but I realized that church members were so comfortable. And I kept asking myself, whilst I was anxious there in the foyer, you know, I said, I'm finished today. I keep checking with uh, Brother Jay. I said, uh, do you know what time is it? <laughs> Uh, it's never happened in this church. Uh, but Elder reassured me that it is the Lord's time and not our time. So when there's a preaching going on, message going on, let's just absorb it, enjoy it, and let the Lord lead. This afternoon, I don't know how I'll be able to engage with you, just like Pastor engaged with all of us last week, but I can ask the Holy Spirit to engage with each and every one of you today. Amen. Um, I would like to welcome our uh, listeners on uh, YouTube. Uh, most importantly, my dear friend, Kevin Hoyle. I know he always watches us. He's one of the um, admirable gentlemen who always want to be part of you know, what's happening in Preston Church. I would like to throw in an invitation, and I'll reserve a pew here for you on the 7th of December. If you can hear me, Kev, please, we would like to see you here. It's, it will be a special day for the whole family. Amen. Today, our topic is laborers in his harvest. Laborers in his harvest. When I look around, I tell myself, this is a good harvest, amen? And God uses this scenario, this illustration, to point to a spiritual harvest. But I know who are the farmers who brought this from their farms. Are they here? Anyway, if you don't want to show yourself, I still want to pray for you and thank you for taking good care of us uh, by doing your hard work in your farms so that we can be nourished physically while the Lord also bless us spiritually. Amen. I think it all goes hand in hand. We need to be healthy, energetic to carry on the word of God. Uh, but if I should ask, how much do we know about what goes in or how these things are harvested? Uh, Maybe we might have some knowledge in some of them, uh, but there is one that came into mind, sweet corn. Sweet corn. Uh, I happened to, you know, watch this documentary two nights ago. I thought this is good for my preaching, you know. Uh, and then those with me, our four people, they got to know I'll be preaching today. Uh, these are how we sow little seeds here and there, and they keep asking questions. Um, so I got to find out that when it's harvest for sweet corn, the time is, you know, it's ripe and ready for harvest, you need to be consistent in the way you go and pluck them 24-7. Every time counts when it comes to, you know, harvesting the sweet corn. And if you delay even just a day, it means you are going to lose the sweetness the juicy part, and the freshness. I said, wow. Then I told myself, this is exactly what our Father in heaven is doing. He's ensuring that his harvest are well protected. His harvest, you know, are untouchable. Uh, and he did so much that, you know, to ensure our salvation in the end. Let us pray. Our Father God, we want to thank you for your mercies and grace towards us, even though we don't deserve them. But each day and more, you always reveal unto us each step of the way to get to you, know you better and understand you better so that 
all the blessings that you have in store for your people, we will get them 100% and full in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the harvest, we say, is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Jesus Christ, in so many accounts, have made this known to his disciples. John had an account. Luke also had an account at some point. Uh, Matthew also had an account. But before all this, you know, come to, you know, reality, there's something that, you know, has to be done. Christ will have to first travel through the north, um, down to Galilee, to Jerusalem. Um, and why is he doing this travel? Because his time was near. Or oh, his time is getting near. And he knows what is going to happen to him when he gets to Jerusalem. It must take courage. It must take, you know, uh, determination. And above all, love for our Savior to embark on such a journey. Because knowing that you go and people will be, you'll be rejected, uh, be, be, be mugged, be stoned, and in the end you're going to die, you still want to embark on such a journey. He did all this because he loved you, you and me. Amen. He made this known to them in Luke uh, chapter 9, verse 22. He said, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders. And chief priests, scribes, he said, be killed. And on the third day, he will rise again. Amen. He knew what was happening to him, but he still went. In chapter 10, uh, in verse 10 of the uh, chapter 19 of verse 10, he went on to say, The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. His purpose was to seek and to save the lost. He came to bring salvation to you and I. In other words, our eternal salvation. Amen. To those who were lost and dead in their sin. These are the people he came for. He came to turn around those going their destructive way. He came to bring hope to the hopeless and healing the sick, comforting those who are uncomforted. And he did all this because of the love he had for you and I. So before he embarked on this journey, there's something he needs to do. He needs to first send forth some of his disciples to go and make himself, you know, make him known to the people. You know, when you, you become an ambassador, you know, your role is to project your country. Yeah, you project whom you represent. Uh, as Christians, we are to do the same. Amen. When you ask, you know, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, yeah, there's a lot to come out, you know, when you come be a Seventh-day Adventist. I met this lady very recently when I asked, you know, his, her name rang a bell and he said uh, he attended church on, at, you know, Prestige Church. Uh, so my next question was, do you know me? And he said, no. But he knew Elder Jabulani. Amen. <laughs> the pride, or let me say, the joy, the excitement for her telling me she's a Seventh day Adventist and that she attends church, you know, at Preston Church. You know, I was a bit concerned because I've not seen this lady in church. This also tells me that the foundation that we build with our children, bringing them to church, you know, 
teaching them the way to, to salvation is never a waste. Amen. Wherever they go, there is still that come back is still there. Amen. And when the time comes, but God wants us to do something. It requires us to pray earnestly. Amen. Because if we continue doing that, that is how he brings them in. Amen. Yeah, so there was this embarrassment on his face. When I said, uh, do you know me? He said, no. I mean, if you made her aware, I'm preaching today. Um, but then we left it there because we couldn't continue due to the environment where we were at the time. Amen. Uh, so Christ sent forth the disciples. He said 72 of them. What's we're going through this. I would like you to open to the Luke, Luke chapter 10, verse 1 to 24. This is where our discussion will be going through. Um, he sent forth 72 of them, and to them, he, took, he sent them in pairs. That means two by two. Amen. And uh, there is knowledge in this, or there is some experience when you send people out in twos. In those days, you know, for you to be accepted or a testimony should be accepted, you require two people to witness what has happened before it could be accepted. Uh, that could be a reason why Christ sent two people out at a time. It could also mean that, you know, um, there is strength in numbers. Uh, also, it's a two, better, it's head, but, uh, two heads are better than one than one. Uh, so there is a reason. And recently we also got to know in case you're doing a Bible studies and there is two of you, if a question is asked, whilst you are thinking how to answer, your other partner probably have got the answer, whilst you are having, you know, that rest. So it's important that we go out in twos when going to spread the word of God. Amen. Yeah, so they went in twos um, just to prepare the grounds, proclaiming the message that they have heard, witnessing of what they have seen. Because if you are with the master, it means you and I have not even seen him. You know, all we see is we've heard, we've read, um, we experience, we, 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 we have testimonies, but we've not seen the real Christ. Amen. These are people who have seen the real Christ, what he has done. And because of their unbelief, he has to do so many miracles. But he said, blessed are those who have not seen, but yet they believe. This is where our blessings come. We've not seen, but yet we have believed him. Matthew also recorded this harvest. He said, Jesus went through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowd, he had compassion. Amen. Their generation and our generation now it is almost the same. When we look around us, when we look on the telly, um, the news, all what is going on, it's all disheartening. We sit down and say, do you have compassion over all what is happening around people in this life? I met one of my neighbors just this morning. Uh, I also told her I'm preaching today, amen, uh, because she asked, you know, she has always known that we go to church every Saturday, uh, but then uh, I said, when are you visiting us? He said very, she said very soon, uh, but she made me aware about her dislike of, for internet, and you know, and I said, you can even watch me online, you know, <laughs> yeah, but the more I try to, you know, do all my campaign, you know, she said, you know, I, I, I hate internet, I, you know. Yeah, she had her reason, uh, amen. Yeah, sometimes people want it quiet yeah, because there's so much happening on the internet uh, these days, amen. Yeah, so our generation is not different from the time when Christ was, was around. And, and that's the main reason why once we become Christians, then we take up his nature, that nature of compassion, that nature of love, that nature that goes out there to seek the loss and to direct them. 
into their master. We've seen all what is happening even within our churches. Um, I would just start with my own family, how I brought my boys here and, you know, um, and now I can't see three of them, you know. Uh, we're still praying for them. Uh, the big one, when these things happen, it, it becomes so hard for us as Christians. I remember when I have to introduce, you know, um, my, my article, it, I'm still even struggling now to, to even say what I'm saying now. Um, because I couldn't call her my daughter-in-law. So I asked my son, when at all are you getting married? Because for boyfriend and girlfriend, now three children, you know, on their way, or three children now, what you expect as a Christian family is for us to do the right things. Things that are scriptural. So when I say it is hard for me, you should understand how hard it is. When we got here, we, we met our elders, how they, they spoke sadly about how they are on their own now, their children are no more. And I thought it could not happen to me. But now we see the reality. But we've never given up, amen. We are still praying that Lord will bring them to the full, it's, it's full, amen. amen. In John 4, it said, Jesus traveled through Samaria and was tired. He stopped and rested. This is where he met a Samaritan woman. Uh, whilst his disciples went out there looking for food, uh, because they were hungry, Jesus Christ saw an opportunity, opportunity that we all have in our daily lives. Amen. He approached the Samaritan woman and uh, did ask for water, but the Samaritan woman object or oppose because how could he a Jew, you know, uh, interact with, with such a person like, you know, uh, the Samaritan woman. But uh, upon revelation, she understood who was talking to her. Amen. And but before the disciples will return back with food, something happened. The Samaritan woman went to his, the, 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 the town, told the, 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 the city people, you know, the, the, the neighbors, that come and hear what uh, I'm hearing. So they came in their numbers. Uh, he said he has seen somebody who has told her all her past. He must be the Messiah. Amen. Because he's the only one who knows all secrets. Amen. Who knows our in and out, the omniscient, all-knowing, the eternal Father. Let me read this to you. It says, when the disciples came back with food, Jesus was telling them he had already eaten. Amen. He has already eaten. So he tells me that if you and I go out there spreading the word of God, touching people's hearts, God's belly gets full. Amen. His belly gets full. So let it count as joy. And sometimes we know these skills are built with time. Some people don't even know how to break the eyes or the opportunity to, to just say uh, how to even begin <laughs> to approach a person. But maybe there is a way. We can start by commenting on what the person is wearing. We can even start by what they are doing for the weekend. You just start with them, and then they will intend ask you a question, and then that's where you come in. Amen. So we can all start this way. When he asks you, are you doing something nice this weekend? And you say, you're going to church this weekend. And he would like to know. What church? Saturday? Oh. Yeah, so that's your opportunity. Amen. Christ had an opportunity. I don't know where we don't want to miss this opportunity when they come. And Christ is always showing us how these things are done. Amen. Things that are important, things that are immediate, 
we should prioritize. Amen. We're still looking at verse 1 and 2. After these, the Lord appointed the, uh, the, the 72 of his the disciples, uh, others, and sent them to go ahead two by two into towns, places, um, because the laborers are few. Looking at the population that time in uh, the town where Christ was and this number, we would say it's, it's somehow adequate, uh, but it could be more. When I look at that number and uh, looking at the projection of population in Preston, we were talking about 330,000 in 2024. This is the projection. And our population here could be about, let's say, 200 membership or less. Yeah. So now we work out the ratio. If we are to go two by two, spreading the word of God, God, where do we fall short? We have about two million, billion, are you listening? Billion, 2.05 billion Muslims in the world. They, they say the second largest congregation after Christianity. We also have 1.2 billion Hindus, uh, 1 billion um, who are non-religious. It's still, they don't believe in anything. Um, there are 737 million ethnic religions and 506 million people around the world practicing Buddhism. So we ask ourselves, how many missionaries are there um, to cover all this group? Um, the latest number of, or figure is 430,000. And of those billions that don't know Christ, is it how many will be unrich? Because which means missionaries don't match or don't, don't meet anywhere. When you do the ratio, it's like we are far, far short. Amen. And this is where the Lord is calling on each and everyone when you become his, when you become one of him. We thank God for how he has brought this church. Uh, first, I was saying um, our fathers and mothers, through the grace of God, they came all the way from Caribbean, kept the faith until now. We got a building, and Presley Church is standing. Amen. 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 The Africans also came in. Uh, Eastern Europeans, everybody is here. Uh, everybody is playing his part. And just recently, the church family from Asia are with us now. When I look at these statistics, Pastor Sabu, this is why I say you have to shout because this is your time. This is the time where the Caribbeans have done this, Africans have done this, East Europeans have done this. It's the time for the Asians to do this. Wherever the Spirit takes you, we don't have any restrictions where English, English language has become the, uh, the, 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 the only language to be spoken on pulpit. We thank God even the government knows best where he gives interpreters. How much more God's house? We want to see how everybody is contributing to the building of the kingdom of God. We shouldn't let language, you know, give us that barrier. Uh, let everybody worship God as to how. So, Pastor Sabu, I pray that the next time you mount this puppet, please. Speak your language. Yeah. Elder Hamilton, is he there? Yes. You are sure you get us an interpreter? 
place and let's see how God will work miraculously among us. We prayed that this church will be full. I know how the Asian community can do this. And that is why the Spirit is impressing on me this afternoon. Let everybody be worship God. We want to see the choir singing. We want to be strong and ready for his harvest. But there is something we can do. If we can go out there in our numbers to preach, the test is saying, it said the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. You see, pray that God will send out workers. Amen. You might not be able to go out there, but God is saying, the least you can do is to pray. Amen. Go on your knees. So our prayer ministry, every Wednesday, this is to be our top of our prayers, that God will send out his messengers to preach the word of God. Sometimes, you don't know how these things happen, but they are happening. It took the earnest prayer of people to bring all of us here today. Somebody is praying that United Kingdom should be represented by a, a big number of Seventh-day Adventists, and that is why we are here today. We pray that our pews will be filled, and lo and behold, our Asian family came, and they can do more. It is prayers, amen. And not just any prayer, but earnest prayers. In 1 John 5, 14 to 15, he said, And this is the confidence of that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us and if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. What does this mean? Is that if we pray earnestly, my brothers and sisters, that chapter in Luke 10, verse 2, is that it will be answered through prayers. We get to participate, we get to play our part when we pray. This is kingdom building, life changing, church planting. All this is happening because of somebody's prayers. I'll just tell you a short story. Uh, this is about my uh, father-in-law of blessed memory. He one day got up, you know, came back from work, told the wife, oh, I've had enough of this city life. Always work, work, work. I want to serve the Lord better. Little did he know that it was some prayers from the villages that we need somebody who can teach us the word of God, who can. So it's like the family did not understand him. How could you, somebody who is having a good life here, suddenly just come and say, Pack, we are packing, we are going. I said, mm. My wife was telling me it wasn't easy for them, you know, <laughs> because they have been in the village before. Coming to the city, it's hard in the village, my brothers and sisters. It's very hard. But when the spirit, spirit impresses on you, you just have to follow. These days it's difficult to descend between thus said the Lord, or am I, <laughs> you know, hearing something else? But this man went with his family. And when he got there, oh, indeed, the sheep needed, you know, um, a shepherd. Yes, they needed a shepherd. So through God, they were able to, to do so many studies. Churches were being planted. He ended up becoming, uh, you know, an interpreter. Pastors were coming in. So all along, and now they want him to be a pastor. He said, no way. I still want to be, play my role. Because God calls each and every one according to the, 
the, their duty ability. Yeah, that sometimes you can't go beyond where you are. And indeed, they were blessed. But to survive, he was there you know, economically. Uh, he engaged in farming. They got about 20 acres of land, a massive you know, land. Uh, he hired some laborers from the north who came, very strong, energetic men. You know, uh, They did a good job, very loyal, very dedicated to their duty. And everything was just beautiful. And it was getting close to the harvest. Guess what? There was this head of elephants who could smell the ripe fruits and ready, you know, crops from far distance, and they came in their numbers. And not did they only eat, you know, the food, but they trampled on them. And you ask yourself, where did they sent? In this our role as ambassadors, we're going to face challenges. We're going to face, it's not going to be easy. And that's why he said he sent it out. Um, but he, he reassured that he's going to be with us to triumph, trample over scorpions, snakes. When my father-in-law got there, <laughs> my wife said, you know, she has cried, cried. All the liberals were all crying. He said, how could this be? Because this man went there with all his gratuity. You know, when you finish work and they give you all your money, you went and invest all your money, and then you wake up early, but all is gone, is gone. He just said one thing. He said, devil, you are a liar. Our faithfulness is what God requires to bring the miracle to us. If you don't remain faithful, even at the very lowest of your spirit and your being, God can never move in your life. There is something that God requires. And that's why he said Christ even taught us to pray, to keep holding on. Because the more you hold on, the more you encourage him. He seeing your faith means he has to act. He has to redeem his name as the promise he has given his people. So my father-in-law just stood up. He said, devil, you are a liar. We, we thank God that he blessed him. He's a man who didn't learn any trade from any construction, uh, building construction and even other things, you know. But he just slept, woke up one day, took the shovel, and God said, it's enough. You've done your bit here. Return back to the city. He returned back to the city. He was building mansions, and that became his occupation. Amen. Yeah, so when he, he tells you about what he has built, God, because of his faithfulness, God didn't leave him just like that. He brought him back onto his feet. Amen. There is a part you and I have to play. We all are different with different gifts, talents, energy, opportunity, and resources. But we all are called to obey. Amen. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandment. And what is this commandment? It is all love. Amen? It says we are to love God and love others. Are we doing that? It says because God sent you to the 3.6 billion people. It says a way to train for that field is to love Because you can just say, ah, it doesn't concern me, you know. They can live their life, you know. <laughs> uh, sometimes it's difficult when you, you approach somebody uh, to share the word of God. They don't believe in anything. You feel embarrassed, you know, when you, you want to make some impression, but things are not working out. Let us be who we are. As loyal, as faithful, and you become the reading Bible that everybody is looking for. We can be here populated in this church, but that does not mean that we are all Christians. Amen. So we should all start working this out within ourselves. Do you want to belong? This is my question. How do we belong? 
to the flocks of the Almighty. So it takes love. If you don't love, you cannot even go out there because you don't love God. He says, if you love me, keep my commandment. He has ordered you to go out and preach the word. And he, through this love, you can also have compassion on your brother and keep telling them, you know, how to prepare to the great harvest that is up upon us. We need to say that we believe about Jesus for people to believe. Because if the way you, you respond to situation, the way you, you talk to people, they want to see that godliness in the way you do things. So that when you tell them that I trust in God, they will not be wondering, you know, what is he talking about? Because they see you to be a peculiar people. They see you special. Or there's something that, that is, you know, is with you that attracts them to God. At least that is what we can also do. In Acts 1.8, Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come, come upon up. you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of this earth. We share what we believe with others. He said, God doesn't put how people respond on our shoulders. Amen. Sometimes you want them to follow you to church immediately. You know, no, 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 no. Just leave that to God. Amen. Let's keep sharing the word of God. Let them know your position. Let them know who you are. And like I said, it all happens, you know, as to how you interact with people around you. It's God who causes the increase. We are just calling or we are called just to remain faithful. We have to sit down and do a Bible study with everyone. No, we don't have to. Like the Samaritan woman at well, we can point people to Jesus. We can plant tiny seed here and there. We can do Bible studies and we can offer to pray for them. It's also very important when you tell a colleague, I'll be praying for you, I'll pray for you. Whenever they, they come with their burden, just tap on them on their shoulders. Tell them you'll be praying for them. That alone goes a long way. And be honest because you have promised to pray for them. And there will be a miracle. Next time you go to work, you ask them, how is the situation? And trust God. Amen. In all this, there was an excitement when the uh, 72 people returned with their testimonies, what the Lord has done, the way they healed the sick, the way people listened to them, they brought the news back to Jesus Christ, and there was joy. Amen. There is joy. He said, Jesus adjusts this focus but encourages joy. The disciples saw God's power. The saw people healed, the demons flee, God's power is great. But his grace is more remarkable than that. He refocuses uh, their joy on their salvation. Amen. You know, when you become carried away of some small miracle, God is saying, no, there is something bigger that I want you to possess or have. He wants want us to have eternal life. Amen. He said, I'll be pleased if your names are written in the book of life. So we should make sure we are, we are secured in that book. And how do we know our names are secured? This will take us back to Deuteronomy. All that God has instructed us. If you obey my commandment, if you obey my commandment, brethren, you'll be rest assured that your name will be in the book of life. In conclusion, it said the harvest will never be ripping unless there are reapers to rip it. 
Jesus Christ needs men and women to bring the harvest. Christ's followers today need to see people as Jesus saw them, as plentiful, precious, perplexed, and perishing. We shouldn't delay the master's return. Because if you don't go out there, spread the message. You never know. We'll probably be causing the delay of Christ's return. Because just like he sent the disciples to go forth before he can proceed to his death, he's probably waiting for us to go out there, preach the word of God, so that he can secure as many for the harvest. Maybe we've not done that. And he's asking us this afternoon to start doing that. Amen. Amen. The harvest is ripe. The workers are few. So let's pray. God will send his people out. They will obey. And they will say, what a loving Savior and a happy God we serve. The Lord bless all of you. And may he keep you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.